The door is locked. This unit contains the medical records for Sir Carmichael Clark's patients. Let us study them closely and see if there are any familiar names. Lots of dust. The records from E to Z have not been touched for years. No known names. Disappointing. No dust on the records from A to D. They've been handled recently. No known names. Disappointing. Sir Carmichael's collection could rival that of a major museum. Comside's private collection purchases since 1920. The catalogue for Sir Carmichael Clark's collection. There are some very valuable objects here. Compass point to the thals. Bronze and magnetite. Han Dynasty. Circa 210 BC. Purchased in Hong Kong 1935. There are some very valuable objects here. Already seen similar daggers. A dark dragon for a bright haired maid. See. Attention, Franklin. Task list. A. Ordering Lady Clark remedies. Done. B. Tidying up real estate property files. Done. C. Calling the lawyer about inventory. Done. D. Update the tenant farmer list. Done. E. Update land rent accounting. Done. F. Ordering a restock of arsenic. Done. P.S. I have left on the living room table some of my things I don't want to keep. The locket and the dagger. I am sure you know why. Thora. I see some papers that were not there the first time I visited. These daggers are only ceremonial weapons. I do not think that the crime weapon is here. These daggers are only ceremonial... Valuers report property. Building land located in Comside, Churston Client, Sir Carmichael Clark, April 15, 1935, Court and Brunskill Office. Court and Brunskill. The name is familiar. 
Is that not the name of the firm Donald Fraser works for? Ernest Logan, MD Brighton Cancer Institute, 201 Dusk Road, Brighton, Sussex. To Sir Carmichael Clark, MD Comsite, Churston, Devon. Brighton, 1935, January the 5th. As a man of science, I owe it to you to be completely frank. Lady Clark, your wife is suffering from a generalized terminal cancer. I confess I didn't suspect anything like that during the first exams. But with the test results I have received today, there is unfortunately no place for doubt. I estimate that Lady Clark's life expectancy is no more than one year. Hospitalization would not help in her case, so I advise you to keep her at home and provide her with as much morphine as required to ease her last moments. Yours sincerely, Ernest Logan. Comside's private collection, purchases since 1920. The catalogue for Sir Carmichael Clark's collection. There are some very valuable objects here. Miss Thoragray, Comside, Tristan, Devon. Arsenic trioxide thallium. The Black Dragon's Curse. To Franklin, who will never grow up. January 25, 1928, Car Charlotte. I am not going to leave Comside now. I still have some things to do. Where is the horrible smell of carrion coming from? Something makes me feel uncomfortable. Brown pellets. <laughs> Revolting. Brown pellets. <laughs> Revolting. Ta -ta. The gardener does not follow the alignment. There, that's better. It is symmetrical. There, that's better.
It was probably the gardener who lit this fire. Look here. I wonder if someone wanted to get rid of these papers. This subject would probably be useful to me. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Everything that Thor Grey has left behind comes from Sir Carmichael's collection. He most probably gave them to her. But she chose to leave them here rather than run the risk of being accused of theft. It is understandable when you know just how much Lady Clark mistrusted her. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Thank you. 
Thorgray had no reason to kill someone who only had a few months left to live. The poison she ordered was for rats. The gardener must have made good use of it, considering the stinking remains on the pass not far from the property. I've finished here. I must put the skeleton key back and inform Hastings that I'm returning to London. May you have peace, Carmichael. Charlotte. I must put the skeleton key back and inform Hastings that I'm returning to London. I've finished with this subject. April 1925, Aceh Province, Sumatra. Perfect. Nothing else is keeping me here. If someone has tried to get rid of these documents, they may be important. Hello, Hastings. I have finished in Shurston. I will take the first train. Tell me, do you know how to restore writing on a burnt document? Yes. You just have to soak a cloth with a hydrochloric acid solution and rub the sheet of paper. Then the characters appear. Bien. You have been of great assistance, Hastings. Could you please order the solution as soon as possible? Of course, but what documents do you want to read? You will see, my friend. À ce soir. Donald Fraser is here. He insisted on waiting to see you. This bottle is for our visitors. Personally, I prefer the sherry. This man is tired. Donald is short of sleep, and it looks as if he didn't even bother to undress before going to bed. Mr. Paro, I don't know why I'm here. You 
wanted to talk, and you came to find the only man capable of hearing you. Mr. Prado, since Betty's death, I've doubts about myself. I don't know what to do. And I keep having a horrible dream three nights in a row. Have a drink and tell me about this dream. It's always the same. I'm on the beach with Betty. I grab her round the throat and I squeeze and squeeze until she's dead. Her head falls back and I see that it's no longer Betty. It's Megan's face. Have you seen Megan Barnard recently? Yes, our grief has brought us together. I never really knew her before. She's really quite a remarkable girl. But I would never tell her about my dream. Why not? Is it her you are attacking in your dream? No, it's Betty. And once Betty is dead, it's Megan's face that appears in its place. Very interesting. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Mr. Fraser, I think that the real meaning of this dream is that you are in love with Megan Barnard. Please go on. Do. This dream certainly betrays your guilt. Oh. But what do you feel guilty about? Having killed your fiancé? Possible. Or forgetting her very quickly for her sister? Certainly. And this forgetting is perceived as a second death. So you don't really think I was the one who killed Betty? I do not exclude this theory. I am simply saying that I do not need to know that fact to explain your dream and your guilt. Thank you for being frank, Mr. Poirot. You've helped me a great deal. I'm going back to Bexhill. I'll not take any more of your time up. It is late, Mr. Fraser, and you are tired. I'll sleep on the train. I like trains. It's easy to sleep rock by the sound of the wheels. Poor boy, he seems completely lost. Well, women seem to like him. I think Megan will take care of him. Oh, I remember. Did you order the product I needed? Yes, we'll be receiving it tomorrow. Bien, it is late. And I ask Miss Gray to come tomorrow morning. I have a few questions I wish to ask her. Mademoiselle, I asked you here in order to answer a very important question. Am I right in thinking you said that you did not speak to anyone on the death of Carmichael was murdered? It's the absolute truth. Yet, Lady Clark maintained that she saw you talking to a stranger on the front doorstep. Really? She must have been mistaken. Oh, I remember now. I'd forgotten all about it, but it wasn't important. It was just a salesman. One of those traders who sell stockings from door to door. Can you describe him to me? Medium size. Mm, glasses. Dark suit and a felt hat. Not the sort of man you notice. Completely harmless. That's why I forgot all about him. Nothing else? 
He was very hesitant and shy. Usually door-to-door -door salesmen are very confident, but he wasn't. You did not leave Cheston willingly, I believe. I don't wish to lie. Lady Clark did not appreciate my presence. And Franklin cannot go against the wishes of a sick lady. He is a good man, and he worries a great deal about his sister-in-law. I noticed that you left some personal belongings behind at Churston. Are you planning on returning to Churston? Who knows what the future holds? Bien. I must ask you one last question. Please reply frankly with either yes or no. If Lady Clark had died, would you have agreed to marry Sir Carmichael if he'd ask you? How dare you ask such a question? Sir Carmichael treated me just like his daughter. And all that I ever felt him was affection and gratitude, nothing else. Thank you, mademoiselle. I will not keep you any longer. I met Thora Gray on the stairs. Her cheeks were ablaze, and she appeared to be deeply hurt. Poirot, have you offended the poor girl again? Do you have good reasons for accusing her? I accused her of nothing, Hastings. I simply asked her an important question she did not answer. Let us see if we can answer it for her. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. You must know how to read between the lines, Hastings. When Sir Carmichael refers to paternal affection, he is lying to himself. Read this engraving on the brooch. A dark dragon for an angel with glossy hair. These are the words of a lover, not a father. Lady Clark was not wrong. What if Sir Carmichael had fallen in love with his secretary? That doesn't mean that she forced him to do so. True, there are extenuating circumstances. She is a penniless orphan. But she is calculating. Just look how she avoided it when asked if she would have married Clark. I see. You think she seduced Sir Carmichael for her own gain, and that now she is doing the same with his brother. Praro, your world is a very dark place. Do not get carried away, mon ami. We have another more important matter to settle. Really? Yes. Would you believe that Miss Grey taught me something new? Let us now try and get our brain cells to work.
It's perfectly clear, Hastings, perfectly clear. Indeed, a stalking seller visited Andover, Bexhill and Churston on the day of each murder. We have our suspect. This should be of interest, Jop. Mathematical and Statistical Society's Bulletin, September the 9th, 1935. The Alphabet Murder, a Methodical Madman. It's highly probable that the Alphabet Murderer will kill again. Could we possibly estimate the number of victims in his next crime? Yes, and it is easy. As soon as we know the ratio of towns, cities and villages whose names begin with a D, and the ratio of English people whose names are spelled the same. On the one hand, the ratio of towns, cities and villages in England with a name starting with D, and on the other hand, the ratio of English people with a name also starting with D. After this initial calculation, it is easy to deduce the likelihood of actually being murdered if you belong to the target population. Go to the last page to find our results and details on the calculations. Daily Blague, August 31, 1935. Moustache at half mast. Poirot's repeated failure in ABC case. Sometimes small things trouble great men. Hastings, faithful collaborator of the Belgian detective, knows something about it. Three mornings in a row, he confided to us, the cook broke the egg yolks when preparing Poirot's breakfast. This apparently casual event has greatly disturbed my friend, to the point it breaks his concentration and slows his judgment. I also noticed his moustache, of which he is so proud, being duller than usual. Poirot, I assure you I haven't said any such thing to the journalists. They twist everything. Hmm. 